전설을 만드는지 I know, pandemic I know so. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's weird to be here now and not have a camera or a screen separating us We are actually back in the sense that we are in the same room together We're going to keep dwelling on this because this is freaking us out and <laughs> Rare Delicacies is back as well and uh, I'm happy to be back and, and talking about a whole bunch of stuff that no one is talking about, even though they should, which is the purpose of this show. So, how's it been for you? What a decade the past 15 months have been. <laughs> I can't think of a truer statement said. Don't ask me why uh, of all movies I picked uh, to kick off our return with, but I picked it because this is one that I've been aching to show you for a very, very long time. Uh, it is a film by Kim Ji Woon coming out of uh, Korea. And I think it, one of the other reasons I want to show is because, frankly, Korea has been making some crazy waves right now. Of course, being the first uh, first nation to win Best Picture yeah. uh, in the Oscars with Parasite, and uh, now pretty much every open can say like one of the greatest zombie films that have come out in the past couple of years came from Korea with mm -hmm. Train to Busan. So uh, I had to come up with another one, which frankly deserves. It came out way before either the, either Parasite or Train to Busan, but and frankly deserves an audience because of how wonderfully madcap and wonderfully bonkers it is and also probably one of the best looking action comedies i've ever seen it is called the good the bad and the weird well, i like it already yeah uh this is korea's loving tribute to the spaghetti western uh the the story involves an eccentric thief uh who ends up robbing a train at the same time as a lethal mercenary uh and they're all trying to get a this map, a treasure map, which ultimately will lead them to this unknown bounty of riches. No one knows what it is, they just know that this is something that is going to be worth a lot to the person who finds it. And all the while, uh, both the mercenary and the eccentric thief are being chased by this, uh, you know, true blue, you know, true blue uh, bounty hunter. But then the story escalates in ways that I will not spoil now until afterwards. But it will ultimately culminate in one of the most, I would even say it's a mad, mad, bad, mad world magnitude. I was, I was thinking the exact, I was, I was thinking, are you going mad, 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 mad world? It's, yeah, and it goes full blown mad, 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 mad world where you have chases on horseback with motorcycles. It, it just goes crazy and you're just like, how did we go from this to that? It was actually referred to me by one of my coworkers back, you know, and he, he was a connoisseur of uh, international cinema, and he told me that I would get a kick out of this one. The title, yeah, the title alone is enough to sell me. But, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the title alone is enough to sell me, but ultimately I just became immediately enamored with it, firstly because the camera work is insane. The, the gunfight sequences are probably some of the best film that I've ever seen. Uh, it's so much of not just that you're wondering how, the, how a lot of the stunt work was done, but you're just wondering how the hell the camera was able to be choreographed to move stuff around like that. It's kind of astonishing. So you have not heard about this one at all? Nope. Uh, I had never heard of it before you mentioned it to me. Mm -hmm. And given this description, I am excited. You know, th this will be the first Western we've done. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. Yeah, West, ironically, Eastern Western we've done. This is my recollection. I believe you can find this on most streaming services. Some you have to rent on. Some I believe you have to. Some I think are just available in this. I remember I watched it on um, Amazon Prime. That's where I was like, oh, actually, no, I saw it on Amazon Prime. I, no, it was Netflix, one of those. Either way, you can find it. It is easily accessible. So um, stop the video right here, go watch it, and then come visit us on the flip side. Seriously, uh, the movies, the movies that flip the masterpiece. One thing that kind of kills me, I don't think we've had this. I think the closest I think um, any 
country or any uh, film studio has ever been able to do um, was Rat Race back in like the early 00s. But I kind of miss the epic comedy. Just like the one that is just so colossal. I mean, even Spielberg attempted it with eh, limited reality. I mean, I don't know how you felt about Spielberg's attempt with 1941, but... Um, it's very rare that we have a big epic sized comedy with you know major action sequences and the humor is just by how absurd everything goes that it would justify having this yeah. this craziness all around you. Well, I want to mention the cinematography. Uh, you were if anything you understood it was <laughs> phenomenal. I mean seriously phenomenal. There were shots I was going how the hell did they <laughs> Because cameras were as big as they were, they weren't able to get as fancy with their camera work. But you definitely got the feeling that uh, the director and his company really took advantage of technology with what they could do, not just with the cameras that they had right then and there, but also with editorial techniques. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of those really wild single take tracking shots were not done in act like 1917 style, uh, like yeah. actually done where they actually had moved the camera to one spot cut the take and then put the next camera into the next position and then edit it and then know that they had to edit it together into that one shot and make sure that it was clean enough that it looked like one single uh, shot but either way it's clean it yeah. is so clean i know they use cgi but this thank god the cgi was so either minimal or mm -hmm. um unobtrusive that, it, <laughs> that that they managed to make it work uh the final chase re Seriously, reminded me of Mad Max, and that, and I mean that in the highest oh, yeah. respect. I Any mean, of them, really. The complete batch insanity of it all. Uh, yeah, I I'm always blown away with battle scenes. I mean, especially in the All or Nothing days. Hell, even with Michael Cimino's work on for In Heaven's Gate. Um, granted, some horses actually died making those, but I think it's because I keep that in mind. When I see a battle sequence like that, where there's explosions going all around you, and you got stuntmen on horses, and the horses are rolling with them on top of them. Mm -hmm. And this one has that in spades. How many people, probably, a lot of people probably did get injured in the making of this movie. Yeah, but no matter how careful you are. There's... Yeah, there's always going to be. And, and a lot of those in-camera shots you can see are main actors in those shots i don't i think a lot a lot of them really did do their own stunts specifically to make sure that it looked as genuine as possible and yeah i mean it's hilarious because it all culminates in this final chase with the titular weird being chased on a on a on a motorcycle being chased by chinese gangsters the japanese army but with the bounty hunter also on his ass trying to keep them keep the everyone else off of his ass. The fact that the characters are so well defined as far as just their presence and their demeanor and just that you can pick them out in, yeah. the, in the crowd, that's enough to be able to help you follow what's going on. You never once, even in the chaos of that climax, lose your focal characters because they, they are able to make them stand out so much. Which brings me to another point, the costume. Mm. Uh, again, Blown away by the costumes. I mean, yeah. it's like, I, I, I want, like, every one of those jackets. <laughs> I want every one of those, you know. Some aspects of 19th century fashion really do need to make a comeback, because, let's face it, you look freaking cool, you know, wearing multiple layers with freaking long coats, whipping in the wind, in various shape, way, and form, and even the occasional hats. Even the hats. I'm not even a hat guy, but some of those hats. Yeah, were it's, it's mm -hmm. one of the downsides of living in Florida. Yeah, well, you just can't you really can't do it? Yeah, <laughs> but you know they didn't see them anywhere. They were out in the desert wearing multiple layers. That is true. Yeah, I mean, friggin', you know, Chunny Park was wearing all black. You know, well, black layers and wearing fur and and, and, uh, and wearing and having this wicked anime hair down and down oh, over his eyes, which well, is yeah. not practical whatsoever. But you don't care because it looks freaking cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it really would put the pretty boy looking 
Completely nailed it. Yeah, it didn't, didn't stop him being intimidating. In fact, that the guy, most people wake up with a cup of coffee. He wakes up throwing a knife into a centipede and then follows it up by shooting a couple guns into the base of the hilt to make sure that fucker is long dead. And uh, what's his name? The weird guy wakes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, they established the world so well to know that this is a place where anyone is out to get, to get you. And anyone's out to screw you over. So the idea that anyone is uh, sleeping with guns and have been able to probably have it as a reflex action to wake up to pull their guns, even if it's like, mm. well, then what, what we find out about him later on. Really yeah, exactly. They did give you clues about who he really was. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, the haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah, the off-chance you haven't seen. We'll actually try to keep this one spoiler free. Well, the fascinating thing about um, about the the weird character is well, first off also played by the father from Parasite, which you know is pretty damn amazing. Jesus, I didn't recognize that. That was him. Yeah, that's yeah, it. that was him. Yeah, and it, yeah, and wow. even and even better, Ma Dong Siok, who was uh, played one of the best characters in Train to Busan, who's going to be in the inter who's going to be playing Gilgamesh in um, the Eternals. He's in this as a henchman character. And I picked him out like almost immediately. I was like, oh my god, that's him. So you're seeing like a great array of of acting talent coming you know, from Korea in this movie, and uh, so and they're on full display here. But the thing I was going, the point I was going to get to about the weird character is that he is in so many absurd life or death situations where you are wondering how the hell this guy is still alive. Well, everyone else is dropping all around him. I just figured he was honestly until the end. I just figured lucky. Yeah, just lucky. Yeah, he had Ram. He had he has whatever power Rambo has. <laughs> the one where you know five thousand bullets go towards Rambo and they all miss. <laughs> or um or the A team, you know, because yeah. the A team just miraculously always are able to dodge the bullets. Right. Yeah, I just figured. <laughs> was, I mean, you know. the, the the whole movie was a comedy, so mm -hmm. why not throw a little more slapstick? Exactly, and you know, you lead to the next great point. It's the fact that the movie has such a has an unashamed absurdist edge that you could truly believe that a character would that be that comedically lucky to be able to survive all the crazy situations that he goes through throughout the course of the story. When it gets serious about the revelations about these characters. It never it, it doesn't feel totally out of whack with the rest of the movie. They still established at the very very beginning that this is also still a dark movie as far as like the violence goes. I mean there are some pretty violent sequences. A lot of people die. Yeah, a lot of people die and they uh they don't they don't do PG thirteen blood either. No, they're no. Does this have an MPA rating? Yes it does. Actually this is a full blown R. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it, well yeah it deserves yeah. it. But, yeah. And it deserves it. I mean there's a whole comedic sequence where Chung Yi Park is trying to cut off <laughs> Unfortunately, he can't because the knife is dull, and he's actually trying like, can someone give me a sharp knife? <laughs> I saw you doing this during that bit. You were just like, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you see that he's actually cutting into it, but he's not getting through the bone because the knife is dull. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, really? You got to pick... You gotta pick the index finger. Do, do the pinky, dude. Do the pinky. <laughs> no, because the whole point of cutting up the. Because you can't pull a trigger with a pointer finger. Right. Loved in one scene, he's doing a dance move. Later <laughs> on, you realize that that dance move was a fighting technique. Mm -hmm. uh, and it. What, uh, a really well done fighting technique. <laughs> uh, I, I was. Yeah, I was. I, without again, without spoiling it, I yeah. was seriously in awe of that scene. One thing about great treasure hunt movies, all the other ones tell you what the treasure is flat out. I mean, Mad World flat out says that it's a criminal's fortune that he had buried. Rat Race is just about a million dollar prize. Uh, this is one well, where they all... did say it was the a King Dynasty's treasure. Yeah, but they don't tell you exact. All they say is that it's treasure. Yeah, it's treasure. And everyone's going, and all you know is that this must be a treasure so momentous that it's willing, and it's going to justify all these people clamoring together, regardless. And and the thing that's hilarious is when you see the reveal of what the treasure turns out to be. You actually kind of it makes everything. You look back on everything that went down, and you realize I wager anyone who stumbled up on this treasure, I'm pretty sure the majority of them wouldn't know thing one of what to do with it. Yeah. With the exception of the Japanese army, I don't think anyone else would have known what the hell to do with it. 
Even at the very end, one of them goes, what the hell is that? Yeah. I, uh, well, okay, I'm not going to lie. I thought there wasn't any treasure. Or mm. it was something like water. You, or... you, you thought it was going to be Crystal Skull. Knowledge is the treasure. Yeah, or right. I, 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 something along those lines. I was Because the translation of the map was so vague <laughs> and could have been mistranslated so easily that I was like, <laughs> this could, I mean, so I, I have no idea what this is. It could be anything. I think a lot of it really does hit home the importance of how film can bridge gaps between nations. Because let's face it, this film would not have been made possible were it not for the influences of cinema styles from other nations. I mean, this one, you can easily see a lot of the heavy influences from American cinema, especially uh, the Western, but you can even see a lot of the spaghetti Western influences. I'd like to mention also the uh, Japanese samurai yeah. influences. If you look back on a lot of the histories of the spaghetti Western, especially going back to the work of Sergio Leone, I mean, of course, legendarily, The Magnificent Seven was obviously based on Seven Samurai. You know, Seven Samurai. It's just kind of like just a love letter to the idea that one, one, that the stories that we tell, regardless of geography, just lend, can work no matter where you do. Just, and the idea that you can cherry pick, you know, concepts from other nations and to make just something that is exclusively your own. I mean, yeah, you could say borrows from other aesthetics. But in the end, The Good, The Bad, and The Weird is a one-of-a-kind movie, despite that. Yeah, and uh, the fact that they borrowed from different things. I mean, there was a very famous scene near the end, that, which was very obviously taken mm -hmm. from Good, Bad, The Ugly. Of course. Be because, yeah, I, well, yeah. I was reading the whole movie for, okay, we're not yeah. going to do this, we're going to, here it comes. <laughs> I think that's my other favorite thing, too, is that, you know, other epic comedies always end just big, just completely big. I mean, even 1941 ends with a house falling off of a, a cliffside. Um, this one, despite everything that happened just a couple minutes prior, in the end, it all just boils down to a standoff between yep. our, our three main characters, and it feels right, and it does end exactly the way you would want it to end, as far as just yeah. these three people, the resolution between the three of them. And, there's, and it does leave it just vague enough you know, to let you fill your own personal gap so you can still be satisfied uh, by it. Yeah. You know, whether or not they're alive at the end or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is they all kind of really kind of come to their own... Conclusion. Conclusions. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, for those of you watching at home, I cannot recommend this movie enough. Uh, find it, borrow it, steal it, do whatever you have to do. Seriously, <laughs> this is a great freaking movie. And I... And, now you understand why, for our triumphant comeback for Rare Delicacies, yeah. I wanted to choose this one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this one, for our big return, for our big reopening, this one is truly on, on the menu. menu.